of uh, racism and, and, and living in the United States as a black man in the world. And so I, I think I'm going to try and do that for you. And if you've got any questions, I, uh, you can ask them after I, I finish. And um, I think I have some written questions also. So just my background, I lived on Central Avenue around the corner from Cacciola Place. And uh, early on in my life, I lived at Cacciola Place. I went to Columbus grade school, which is no longer there. And then I uh, went to Edison Junior High School and then Westville High School from 1996 through 1973. Uh, when I was in Westville, I always got the feeling that my teachers, my town was pulling for me to excel. All of us, black or white, the fact that I was an athlete, no doubt helped insulate me from racism in Westfield. Nevertheless, I bleed Westfield blue. I have several blue suits. I make sure that one room in my house is painted blue. I travel across the country to go to the Hall of Fame ceremonies in Westfield. And that comes from my positive experience that cannot be denied. I just think we had some exceptional teachers uh, during my period. And hopefully you guys have them as well. My best friends were guys on the wrestling team, Charlie Schroep, who was white, uh, Trip Heinegger and, and Rich Gottlick, uh, we were a team and we were friends. Um, I developed my love for sports from my little league coach, Bruce Johnson. Um, if you ever watch uh, Mr. Hollis Opus, uh, that movie uh, where the teacher gives his life to students and their lives were enriched because of it, Bruce is that guy. Moreover, because my positive experience in West Westfield uh, dealing with these individuals like Charlie Schroep, Bruce Johnson. Uh, I understand the problem with racism is not with white people. The problem is with white supremacy. I went to, uh, to college at the University of Iowa. At that time, when I went there, they had never won a national championship as a team. Um, I, had, I won two uh, individual national championship titles at Iowa, and the team won two titles. Thereafter, at Iowa, we dominated the team national championships for decades. Um, uh, the students really uh, gave a good uh, uh, synopsis of, of sort of my athletic career. So I don't, I don't think I need to go much further. So let, let me talk about uh, my experience with racism. And outside of Westfield, I understood I was living in a time when our country was a apartheid state. If you traveled to the South, you had to worry about the KKK. You couldn't use bathrooms, stay in hotels, stuff like that. Uh, black people had to create what they call a green book to figure out safe places to stay in the South. My great grandmother was in, in Virginia, so we traveled from time to time. Up North, if you tried to play golf as a black man in many places, you weren't allowed in. We, we like to act like slavery was a long time ago. Selling, selling of slaves ended in the latter part of the 1800s. However, I am part of the first generation of black people who did not have a relative that they had met who had been slave. Slavery and the hate, terrorism, and discrimination that supported the ideology of slavery is white supremacy. Nevertheless, I could see the effects of slavery and white supremacy in Westville. I wasn't blind. My mother worked for white people literally on the other side of the track. It was sad to see how she had to genuflect such niceness to, niceness, niceness to white people. I used to be so angry about her about that. But then I realized that such a response was nothing less than a survival skill that all black people had to learn. Never look at a white person in the eyes. Always walk around white people if they were walking towards you. And white people would never step aside. Never argue with a white person and never ever date a white woman. These were things drilled into me for survival. I loved my mother, but I was not having any of that baloney. I love to poke the bear and there's nothing in white supremacy hates more than a confident, intelligent black man. It destroys their myth they are working under. I was outspoken, not in Westfield, because my experience was incredibly positive. But when I go to Iowa, when I went to Iowa, you know, that was different. To be clear, when you poke the bear, you get beat down, but man, it could be fun. Uh, but nevertheless, I had a typical racial experiences in New Jersey. Uh, on the boardwalk in the seaside, uh, Rich Gallick and I were walking down the boardwalk boardwalk one evening. Uh, some police started walking towards us and Rich started running away. I was startled. I had no idea why Rich was running. So after a second, I started to run after him and this white cop grabs me, puts a gun to my head and said, up against the wall, nigga. Someone who would put, who would put a gun up to a child's head should not be a police officer. 
And someone who would call an African-American a nigger is a danger to all African-Americans. As a result, Colin Kaepernick is my hero. He sacrificed his football career to save black people from violence from police. My children are safer because of his heroism. At the same time, I love Tom Brady. My daughter always gives me beef about that, being a Tom Brady fan because uh, of his relationship with Trump. Um, I don't know, um, Leslie, do you have the Black Lives Matter um, And yes. That I, yes, I'll pull it up for you. I just want you to take a look at this. It's from Scientific America. They did uh, research on uh, what happens in areas uh, when Black Lives Matter is uh, organized. And so um, hopefully you will have an opportunity to, to, to read this article. Uh, I, I really like to, to have a Scientific American stuff because they, they go over all, all such facts. But I wanted you to see that initially, and you can take that down, Leslie, if you want, uh, to understand my next statement. Anyone, and I mean anyone, who calls Black Lives Matter a terrorist organization is by definition a white supremacist dedicated to the genocide of African Americans. There's no wiggle room there. Like there should be no wiggle room zero tolerance for Nazi and their Nazis and their anti-Semitic rhetoric. My experience in uh, Iowa shattered my belief that anyone who works hard in this country can make it. When I graduated from Iowa, uh, I was not on scholarship anymore. I had a job as a bouncer at a bar. This bar had uh, two levels. The bottom level, and they were, they were separated, had separate interests. The bottom level uh, was a typical Iowa bar with a lot of beer serving, and, and it was always crowded, um, you, know, you know, mostly white people. Uh, but the upstairs bar was like a disco, and you had even that, that ball, the crystal ball up there. It was uh, really a nice, nice bar if, if, if you were into disco. So that bar was always empty. Nobody ever came to it. So uh, I told the manager when he, of, of the bars, I said, look, you give me this bar on the worst night, and I can show you that I make money. Uh, so he agreed. And so the, the night I got was Tuesday night. I realized that no one in Iowa was catering to the needs of the black community. There was a demand, but no supply. So I brought a couple of hundred dollars of albums, you know, Earth, Wind & Fire, Marvin Gaye, stuff like that. I made flyers and I had them shipped around uh, schools all over the state. Real entrepreneurial stuff, you know, the stuff that you're talking about. The night came around, the disco was packed. I had hired three, uh, three uh, bartenders. It was so busy, uh, I had to get behind the bar with them to sell alcohol. So man, I had done it. You know, I had done, did that great entrepreneurial American thing. At the end of the night, the managers came up to me and said, we can't do this because we didn't make any money. And I said, you're crazy. We didn't make any money. It was so busy. I had to get behind the bar and, to help uh, sell drinks. And the manager uh, shook his head, well, you know what, Chris, look, I saw one white guy walk up the stairs, take one look into the bar and turn around and leave. We can't have that. I can't have you scaring away my white business. And I said, I said, well, you know, uh, we didn't have any business in this bar. So I was angry, but you know, you needed to make a living. I was training for the Olympics and had a family. Uh, I didn't want to go on food stamps. So I applied the position a position in the city of Coralville, Iowa, uh, which is outside of Iowa City, police position I applied for. The hiring uh, process consists of three phases, a uh, physical test, how fast you could run, how much you can lift, things like that. Uh, I was training for the Olympics, so it was not even close. It was a joke. We also had uh, to take a psychological exam. And then finally, we had to have a written exam. And I was prepping for the law school interest exam at the time. So no surprise, I wasn't hired. I inquired why I wasn't hired, and they told me because I had failed the written test. Well, I knew that was baloney, so I called the Equal Opportunity Agency, the EEOC. They started an investigation, and all of a sudden, I got a job offer from the Corbell Police Department. However, I was afraid to take the job because I thought some white supremacists would shoot me in the back. Eventually, the uh, EEOC came to me and wanted me to sign a release saying I would not sue the Corbell Police Department. In turn, they would agree to hire candidates of color, which they did. When the uh, EELC guy was leaving, he told me, you know, Chris, you had the highest grade of anyone taking the test. 
I laughed about that because I said, you know, if they would have just told me I flunked a psychological psychological exam, I would have had no question because, you know, wrestlers are crazy. So <laughs> when I moved to California, I had to take the bar exam again um, because uh, I had passed the bar in Connecticut. But when you move to a different state, you have to take a uh, bar exam. Uh, and the California um, government was going through a budget battle at the time. So they couldn't do the investigations of each candidate to complete the complete the process. So in the interim, I applied to a police officer position, and I believe it was the city of Vacaville. They had a test also. I, I was told I flunked that test as well. Uh, I did not pursue the issue because by that time I had passed the hardest bar in the country, the California bar. So I could start to practice law. Right now, the city of Vacaville is under a consent decree with the federal government because they've killed so many black people. The officers were putting notches on their shields to show how many black people they had killed. I don't know whether I flunked with the back of the test, but I can tell you that I have taken two bars, the Connecticut bar and the California bar, and passed them both the first time. According to police, I've never passed a police exam. The only job I ever wanted was a head wrestling coach job at a university. I was a two-time national champion, one of only seven Americans who had won a world championship at that time. Not only couldn't I get a job, I couldn't get an interview. So I was hoping to get the opportunity uh, to be a coach uh, if I had won the Olympic gold medal. I started in 1997 uh, making international wrestling teams. However, I noticed when I was trained, when I was competing in the U.S. Uh, and competing against a white person, the refs would call me for stall all the time. And so at that time, wrestling was uh, the matches were three three minute periods you had a three minute period you had a one minute rest three minute period one minute rest and then the final three minute periods you got four cautions before you were thrown out you got a warning one point against you one point against you two point against you then you were thrown out when i would lose in in, in wrestling in the u.s it was behind stolen points and i had noticed that back back black athletes had the same experience i had one particularly uh, irritating match where I was on the edge of the match uh, and the referee had blew the whistle and stopped the match. Uh, the wrestler, the guy who I was wrestling, his name was Mark Liebman, jumped uh, on, onto me and put me to my back. And so I just I fell back. The, suit, the two side judges called me Penn. The match judge went up to the side judges and said, he can't be pinned because I blew the whistle. The two side judges said, it doesn't matter, he's pinned. And for me, this was some real corrupt stuff. So I faced a, a dilemma, quit wrestling because it was rigged to get in such good shape that I decimated the competition. I chose the latter. During the 1980 Olympic trial, the defending Olympic gold medalist, John Peterson, was in my weight class. Three-time national champion and future 1984 Olympic gold medalist, Eddie Bannett, was in my weight, my weight class. Mark Schultz, three-time national champion and future 1984 Olympic gold medalist, and two-time world champion was in my weight class. And the guys who father and the guy whose father bragged that his son Penny Mark Liebman was in my weight class. Before the matches, I was pacing around uh, like I usually do, but it was a little bit different because I had trained so well that I I wasn't nervous. I just really felt sorry for the guys I was going to wrestle because I genuinely liked them. Uh, they were all nice guys because I knew I was going to they were going to get the worst beating in their life. Mark Schultz lost before he got to me. I beat John Peterson by over 10 points. I beat Eddie Bannock with over 10 points and it was not close. And my friend Mark Lieberman got beat down. At the end of the first three minute periods, I was beating him 11 to four. After three minutes of wrestling, in which I had scored 11 points, the refs had cautioned me four times. The refs came over to my corner and stated, one more caution and you are disqualified. Uh, and the referees were clapping and cheering. The fans started booing because it had gotten so blatant that the, the head referee then came down to the three judges uh, who were you know, on the mats and said, you can't disqualify him for stalling in, in the next stalling call because he has scored over 10 points, so he gets an extra caution. The score ended 23 to 6. Note, I was on my last caution. But you know, there was no happy ending for me. A man named Jimmy Carter was present at the time. 
Russia was involved in a war with Afghanistan. You know, the people we're fighting and killing now. After doing many family lineages, doing my family lineage, we determined that my ancestors were owned by Jimmy Carter's ancestors. I wanted to be a coach at the college level. I knew the only possible shot was to be an Olympic gold medal. However, Jimmy Carter decided that he could, we would not go to the Olympics. Now, the United States Olympic Committee, which is called the USOC, is a nonprofit corporation and not a government entity. And they swear allegiance to the International Olympic Committee, saying they will not let politics interfere with the games. So the USOC, as they should have, they, did, they refused. They said we were going. After that, Jimmy Carter stated to them, if they went to the Olympics, he would remove the USOC's nonprofit status. With that threat, uh, the boycott uh, became a reality. Thus, at, like his ancestors, he had stripped me of my ambition, my life's ambition, my life's work, in a real sense, um, you know, the life that I really wanted. But what really infuriated me about, about that issue was that ABC or NBC, I don't know which one it was, was able to go to Moscow, film the games, and they broadcast them in the United States. The question was, how do I feel about it now? I get more angry about it every day. This man felt it was his right to take away my life's work, my legacy, and my future. I wanted to be a coach. That was my best shot. I was absolutely uh, decimating the competition. The following year, I defeated the 1980 1980 Olympic gold to win the world championships. It was not close. So I want to impress with you, with respect to racism, uh, why it's so dangerous. Let me talk about what I think racism is. To me, it's simply whenever you treat a human being like the other, those people. When you see a group of people starting to use this type of rhetoric, you know really bad things are about to ha happen. White supremacy is a genocidal cult a murderous terrorist movement it has been for centuries. The United Nations defines uh, genocide as acts committed with the intent to destroy and hold or impart a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group, such as killing members of the group, causing serious bodily injury or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group forcefully transferring children of the group to another group. Racism always leads to genocide. To you, you need to look no further than this country to figure that out. We were taught in, uh, in uh, Edison Junior High School uh, that uh, this country was created by Europeans in line with their sacred rights, their manifest destiny. This country, however, was created by genocide. We killed over 20 million Native Americans, some say up to 100 million in the name of white supremacy. The Nazis killed 6 million Jews. The Nazis liter literally learned how to create laws and systems to kill the 6 million Jews from what the U.S. did to the Native Americans and slavery. Many of our country's heroes were nothing less than monsters. Uh, we used to watch cowboy and Indian movies. Uh, um, you know, in the 60s and 70s, where the nice white people were being scalped by the savage Indians. As it turns out, in real life, the people scalping were the white supremacists. You have to understand, white supremacists were paying a bounty for killing the Indians. And because of this bounty, they were killing so many Indians, they couldn't handle the full body. It was just so too many that were dead. So they devised the method of scalping as a proof to show that they killed the Native Americans. And so then they could present it. The first governor of the great state of California paid $25 a scalp for Native American children. Some real human rights violating evil genocidal stuff. This type of twisting of the story is still in use today. If you watch Fox News and OAN, for OAN, for example, you will see that they blamed the capital insurrection of Black Lives Matter and Antifa and other left-wing propaganda provocateurs. Now, anyone with eyes could see the rioters were white supremacists supporting Donald Trump. But I guarantee you that in 10 years from now or so, they will be saying it was Antifa as if that was a fact. You know, I watched these channels, and then I imagined, uh, what if these people making those statements were actually the Black Panther, Panther Party? These channels are promoting war against the United States almost every night. 
If they were the Black Panther Party, they would be labeled a terrorist organization and their leaders would be assassinated. To me, the United States is the Constitution and the right to vote. The right to life is the most important one, but the right to vote is fundamental, fundamental to that right, and people are attempting to destroy that right today. You can see so many uh, states that were historically slave, slave states attempting to uh, limit or take away the right to vote. These people do not believe in the United States. If you listen carefully, they will admit it. They carry Confederate flags. The Stop the Steal concerned a number of places where Trump stated the machines were wrong. Look carefully. Those machines were wrong only in areas that had large minority population. There was no complaint or cases brought regarding Stop the Steal in white areas. The steal of which they sing is the right of people of color to vote. The ideals of equal rights, the right to vote, our democracy is in grave danger right now from these people. Slavery in this country is more than human rights violation. It is an abomination, an evil so great you cannot understand the depths of it. Only the genocide of Native Americans is worth. Those who support the Confederate flag want you to believe that slaves are were okay with slavery. Slave masters were kind. And we know that in order to keep order, the slave owners had to rape and torture African Americans. The stench of it is so great that almost every country in the world has abolished slavery, but not the United States. To this day, slavery is legal in, the, in, in this country under the 13th Amendment of the Constitution. And when you have private prisons whose only mission is to make profit, as we do in the United States, you have full-blown slavery in the U.S. today. In Haiti, when the slaves revolted and kicked the slave owners out of their country, this country placed an embargo on Haiti not allowing them to participate in commerce to, to destroy the country. The United States argued that they needed reparations, pay from the government for taking of their property, you know, people like us. The reparations were paid. Where are the reparations for the labor of black slaves? In South America, we, the United States, have engaged in and trained people to commit genocide on indigenous people like we did in Native America. I think like every day an indigenous pe person is killed for trying to protect their land for the from uh, big corporations. If you are wondering why so many uh, Central American people are trying to get into the United States today, that is because our government has destroyed their efforts to self-govern for the benefit of the people. They have become failed states with no government to protect the people, only criminals willing to kill at the government. But this level of evil is not unique to the US. Obviously, Germany was doing it to Jews. Israel, uh, as an apartheid state, is doing that to the Palestinians and taking their land. Africans are killing Africans. Based, you know, the Japanese did it to the Chinese. The Chinese are doing it to Muslims. King Le Leopold of Belgium killed 50 million Africans and mutilated thousands of children. Look them up, some real horror stories. All of this is based on the foundations of racism. I mean, there is some stupid stuff going on and this type of hate, genocidal, genocidal activity can only take place if we let it. If we have a government that doesn't abide by human rights, people will look the other way when it's their tribe. Looking the other way is the true evil. Like allowing, uh, like acknowledging that the uh, Saudi Arabia prince killed Jamal Khashoggi as a US, a US citizen, but providing a no uh, sanctions. So what is racism? Uh, so really, and Leslie, I don't know if you're there, but did you put up the, uh, the Franklin Roosevelt's. Um... Yes, I will. I wanted you to see this and hopefully you get a chance to read it. Franklin uh, D. Roosevelt was a president. Yeah, I think he had four terms. Uh, he was the most uh, popular president. Uh, well, he was, I think, the best president the United States has had. Um, and he, he, he gave a speech, which I think, uh, identifies the, the, the true threat to democracy, to a government that works for the people. And hopefully, I don't know if I'm gonna read this, but hopefully you'll get a chance to read this speech because it's relevant today. Uh, he used the term economic royalty as the enemy of democracy. He talked about uh, them taking over our government and what that would mean. But I can tell you, they have taken over our government and the level of misery in the United States is obvious. So what is racism? To me, what it is, it's a tool to distract me from this reality. 
it is an economic tool to keep people fighting among themselves because of their poor life condition, rather than confronting the true reason for the misery being ruled by economic royals. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were not assassinated because they were complaining about the plights of black people. They were assassinated when they started making a connection between labor and the economic royals. Martin Luther King was going to a labor march when he was assassinated. The Black Panther Party was created to protect its people from police brutality and economic deprivation. They started school meal programs that continue to this day. Black Panther Party leaders were assassinated by the FBI. If you listen carefully enough, nobody is denying this fact. We went to Vietnam to fight an economic idea, communism, the idea that private people should not own the wealth of the country, that the wealth of the country belong to all the people. We have blockades against Cuba for this reason, trying to destroy the country. That country produces some of the best doctors and medical treatments in the world in spite of the blockade. They send people all around the world to help in human catastrophe. But what has that got to do with you? We, the United States government, does not pay for your college. If you want to take the risk of being killed in a foreign country, they will pay for your education. The United States government does not pay for your health care. Our government does not require a living wage for its citizens. But we can spend six trillion US dollars in wars in the Middle East and North Africa killing people of color so that we can have their natural resources. We have predatory corporations making a profit off of your illness. I travel to Europe all the time and work with legal scholars from Denmark to Sweden, from Italy to Germany. They don't have to pay for their health care. Their government pays the bill. We have idiots talking about socialized medicine. I was playing golf with a guy who was spewing that silliness saying, I don't want the government controlling my health care. I said to him, oh, you would rather have a corporation whose only reason for existence is to make a profit from your illness controlling your health care. The world laughs at how stupid the U.S. by not having a national health care system. However, you need to know that the economic royalists, those of which Roosevelt warned of, of warned it that way, it is to their benefit that you have to give them your labor, the only thing you really have, your time. You have to follow their rules, they where they tell you to live. They don't want you to have a way out, so you have to they, so you have to have so much debt leaving college that you're by definition an indigenous servant, and Biden will not provide relief uh, from this debt, even though the effect of the economy would be beneficial. If you have school loans, can't afford to buy a home, afraid to leave a job because of their horrible health care insurance, they got you. You're trapped. It is so bad that many don't today, many students and children don't want to have children any longer. And that should tell you something about how bad things have gone. This situation is so insidious that our culture has begun to internalize this madness. No longer do workers have leisure time. When I was in high school, they were talking about the amount of wealth that would be created in this country um, would result in four day work weeks for its workers. Well, the wealth that indeed has been created, but no one is working for their work weeks. Corporations are running their employees into the ground. We were warned about this from some. We were warned about this, not from some radical communists. We were warned about this from the greatest president in U.S. history, Franklin Roosevelt, and I really hope you read what he said in his speech. Further, if you have a system in this country where money is determined to be speech, like the Supreme Court has ruled, then you have legalized bribery and your government will not take action to support the people, only the corporations. This is what we are living under right now. In the days of Roosevelt, the polls showed that over 75% of the American people felt their country was working for them. They approved of their government. Now, only 17% of American people approve of their government. And, and if you look at the Congress, I think it's like 9%. That is because they know the government doesn't represent them. And the only way to fight back is to, to really make this country as great as it as its promise of being great is, is to be able to vote. Uh, and, and when you vote, looking for people who are talking about how you need to help the people. And, I, and this is the last, um, Leslie, if you have the last screen I wanna show, this is a, uh, an article uh, about uh, Ms. Cortez talking about student loans. When you see people talking uh, about issues that are going to benefit you, you need to start thinking about voting for them. 
And the last thing I want to say before I, I, I start to look at some of the questions that I appreciate the time is that you need to make the connection today uh, to, to, with the issues that we're facing and, and how uh, hard uh, the different uh, states are trying uh, to make uh, it to vote because the vote is important, the most important right in America uh, in terms of uh, of all our benefits, and they are trying to take that away now. So um, let me see. I want to pull up the questions that were asked. So the first question was, how hard was it to go to get get uh, of a get over a potential medal in the in 1980s? Uh, were you mad that President Carter boycotted the Olympics? I think I explained that. How much work and training were you putting in during your senior year of high school? And how much support did you get from your family? For me, um, I just went to wrestling practices. Nothing close to the, the level of training that I realized that you need to work. Uh, you need to work once I got to, to Iowa. I really learned a lot, a lot about wrestling and training in Iowa. Um, and you know, if you have some further questions from the wrestlers, I'd love to talk to them about it. Um, with respect to parents, my mother didn't want me to wrestle. My my mother was a Jehovah's Witness, and she felt that um, you know sports was sort of uh, glorifying yourself, which, which you should be glorifying God. So I never had a parent who was uh, interested in sports at all, and I think actually that's probably the best way to have it. Uh, what was it like being black and growing up in an almost white town like Westfield during the 1960s and 70s? Um, like I said, I had very positive experiences. I can remember, um, I think I was about 10 years old, and I was downtown looking for a, a birthday present for my mother. And I think I had five or $10, I don't know what it was. And so I went into one of these jewelry, jewelry stores, you know, right downtown in Westfield, and I, I saw these uh, pearl necklaces. So I asked the woman, um, hey, you know, can I buy it? And, and she said, yeah. And, and I said, and I said uh, well, how much was it? I, she said, well, how much do you have? And I only had, I only had five dollars. She said, "Okay." So she sold it to me. And so I brought it back to my mother. My mother was appalled because she thought I stole it or something. I never stole, but anyway. Um, so she walked me down back to the store, and the lady said, "No, he was such a cute child. I just, I just couldn't uh, bear not to give him the, the, the uh, gift for his mother." So, you know, that's just another another example of, of experiences that I had in Westfield. Uh, and, you know, that woman obviously looked at me as a child. Not as a black, not as a black person, or one of the others. Um, next question: Did you find the transition from New Jersey to Iowa after a high school as challenging experience? Definitely. Uh, did you notice more or less racism in, in one state versus another? Yeah, Iowa was more racist. Um, growing up in Westfield, were you aware of the racism that was going on in the southern states? Absolutely, um, because you know they were killing and lynching people. I mean, you know, it was like. Uh, all out war on, on black people at the time. You've had uh, you've had a many uh, would consider an incredible successful life, athletically and professionally. How much would you credit your upbringing in Westfield for your success? Like I said, I had some great teachers: uh, Miss Fisher, Miss Fireberg, Miss Ball, uh, Mr. Fusa. Uh, I just felt blessed from uh, the the teachers that I had, and even the principal at the time, which I forget his name. God bless Westville High School. I just felt a very positive experience. Okay, and and also uh, with with respect to that issue, um, 